many years ago, I, I got worried about two main beliefs about bears that, that we have. And one of them, the first one was that they are unpredictable. Uh, the, the second one was that, that they are automatically or inherently dangerous if we ever lose fear of them. And these, I could see, were a huge problem to the bear, and I didn't think they were, they were right, because ever, when my father and my older brother and I did a film about them in 1961, whether well, that's 52 years ago, uh, I, I don't know, I, I look at things a little differently than most people. When I, when I looked at these animals and what they were doing, and they seemed to me like they were peace-loving animals, not, not what we keep talking about. We tell terrible stories about them. Uh, they're always trying to kill us, and you know, it just goes on. But, but that, I recognized, was because I was raised by, my father was quite a famous hunter at one time, he, that, that that's how we have to think about them if we feel want to feel good about killing them, uh, and and once you once you get going on that theme, then then it it just carries on very strongly. So it, it is our hunting culture that that has led us to believe what we believe about these animals, and I just decided that I would I would try to figure out a way that I could explore those main questions around them and really understand them. So that I, and, and they are very lovable animal, believe it or not, and I think my pictures and stories around the slides will point that out. So I'll get started on that right away. This, this uh, first slide is a painting a guy named Nicholas Rorick. He was a Russian painter who lived around the turn of the century. He, he, this is he. And I was just fascinated by, by how he depicted the, the bear in his paintings. He, he didn't paint a lot of bear. I had to go through hundreds of paintings to find paintings of bears. But every time I did find one, this was, this was the way they were depicted. And you can see, as you will see, uh, they're, they're very similar. I didn't learn about this man until you know, long, uh, years, you know, after I was in Russia. So, so anyway, I, but what caught my eye is that, that he depicted them like I know them. <clears throat> and, uh, I didn't quite make it this far. <laughs> I don't know whether whether this is just whimsical ideas he had of bears, like this, like Michael Sawa, a German painter, had. It's called this the 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 girl with the bear. But but when I dug through my slides. Uh, you know, I come up with something like this that would, could, could be called the girl and the bear, too. And, and similar, as you can see. <clears throat> Our, this is the way most people for many years wanted to, uh, I guess, be photographed with, uh, with a bear. But uh, <clears throat> I, you know, this is, this is what's possible. It's not possible, uh, don't get me wrong, you can't go out and uh, be with a, a bear quite like this, but I'm showing you what's possible if, if you have the right attitude, the right knowledge around them, and that you can build, if you can build trust with them. <clears throat> I was raised uh, by my family, my grandfather started this outfitting business in the, uh, 1906. And, and uh, my father took it over in the 40s and I started going on these wonderful <coughs> safaris into the wilderness with 
30, 40 head of horses for a month at a time with people that never, we never saw another person for often for a month. And it, uh, it, it, it this, is, this was me in that 1961 when I started, when we started film, I'm carrying a, a movie camera and and that was the start of my interest in bears and it went through ranching a long time ranching and and then uh with the bears i wanted uh, 18 years i wanted to ranch with them and see if if they really did kill all our cattle and uh, they didn't I, I don't think i lost an animal in 18 years of ranching but <clears throat> and, uh, not that they don't kill cattle, but it, it seems that, you know, if one starts, like, if, it was quite easy to solve the problem, and, and it wouldn't happen again. But then I got more and more interested in bears, and I ended up guiding tourists, bear viewing, rather than bear shooting. And that was a, quite fun, only except that I, I was always tempted to, use my clients as guinea pigs in my experiment. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the, the, here's a, a bear coming up a log, and, uh, and I had a bunch of clients behind the, the, the root pan of the log, and, and the bear just keeps coming, and, and they, they, the, the rules from the park people was that if a bear was 150 meters away, I was to get everybody away. Uh, but, but, uh, <laughs> anyway, so you can see that, that uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't working. <laughs> it, uh, uh, I learned from a, a fellow living on Agmonte Island his name was Stan Price. He, he was an amazing guy and, and he, he said all you need to keep your distance from a bear is a walking stick. Well I had a paddle and these picture, two pictures were taken by clients uh, who were having a great time. But I, I, I just stepped up and held the paddle against the, the bear's chest and the bear stopped. And, and this was this was my way of keeping distance. It wasn't quite 150 meters. <laughs> but, uh, you can see this. You know, people are having fun taking pictures uh, because I wasn't saying, "Oh, this is a dangerous situation." Nobody believed it was too dangerous, uh, and uh, my insurance company wasn't that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I built a, a plane for a project of Jeff and Sue Turner. Some of you probably know Jeff and Sue Turner, uh, who I worked, I've worked with for 20 years. In fact, I'm going, they're arriving my place at, uh, the day after I get home now. On, on next Thursday, they'll be there. And, and uh, we're doing a sequence of the grizzlies going out on the prairie. But at this time, I, we were working on a on a film, uh, the, the Spirit Bear film. That was 1992, and uh, it was an incredible experience. We lived on Princess Royal Island for two years, and uh, and this this animal, it's it's so outstanding. <clears throat> I I was raving about it in a, a series of. Of, of slides, presentations I did down through the states, and one was in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, and it was a very high class school. There was one black person in it, and late when I was raving about the white bear, she came up to me after and said, can you please go over why the white bear is so special? <laughs> Really got me there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's pretty special in the in the dark forest. The next picture is this, these are three black bears sitting on a rock behind that fish, watching the fish, uh, and you can hardly see them. 
and, but <laughs> if, that, if that was a blackberry, you wouldn't see it, uh, but it shines out of the darkness of the rainforest, the great bear rainforest, and it's absolutely amazing. And of course, I, I was experimenting back then, and that was really my first chance to explore what would happen if you really trusted these animals. They, they, they were, it was a really good chance because nobody lived on Princess Royal Island so often, and, and I'm sure this bear, particular bear, he had never seen humans before we showed up. So it was a beautiful uh, opportunity for me to, to see what would, what would happen. And <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> I, I could step over this bear while I was asleep. Uh, and yet it was still quite alert. If a sna twig snapped 150 meters away, he was instantly alert. So I don't know why he, he was, uh, it was just amazing how he could tune out something he wasn't worried about. <clears throat> <laughs> the, the, this is Jeff and Sue 20 some years ago so the, the, the problem came up right away with how do you photograph a bear when he's under your tripod <laughs> <laughs> and it remained a problem here's, here's this was in 2005 it was the, so the same same problem Jeff had. Every time he caught up with me, he was he was trying to back up a little bit. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I just finally I I decided that uh, that I had to do a serious study, which I you know about these questions I talked about to understand bears. And uh, as I said, my insurance agent was quite happy when I decided to quit guiding and, and uh, allowing this sort of thing and, and going go, to go to, to Russia, which The lake that I was is a smaller lake right down south of Krosky. So all this peninsula is incredible wilderness. There's no there's no road going to Kamchatka from the rest of Russia. There's no road into Kamchatka. There's no railroad. There's just right here, Pet the city right here. And it the <clears throat> Yeah, it's whoops, I can't get this. Oh there we go. That's a caldera where they have a beautiful, well, a submarine, a nuclear sub base. This is the other side of it. And, and, and the architecture is kind of weird there because it's so, uh, so much a earthquake zone. And so they, they just built five stories high. Uh, so it's not a pretty city. But it's certainly in a beautiful place. And each, each season for 12 years, we'd load up uh, food for maybe five months in, in a cabin that we built and, and go back there in the spring. <clears throat> and I took that plane of, that I built for the Spirit Bear project and and uh, to Russia, and I was taxiing it through the street here, getting ready to, for another season in the wilderness with it. <clears throat> here, loading up a helicopter uh, with all the food and all our stuff, because we had to take, we had to empty the cabin. It wasn't safe to leave it there in the winter because helicopter pilots would steal things and, and we needed to know what we had, so we bring it to the city. So, Anyway, it was quite a, a session to go back over this incredible wilderness where there are no roads, 
I come from Alberta where you can you can hardly fly for a mile without you know, being flying over some disturbance, mostly seismic lines from, and our ex exploration for gas and oil. So it was just mind-boggling to, to see the wilderness that was there a and amazing geology. This, this uh, volcano with that glacier, uh, one, you know, in one of the years I flew by it, it had burped the whole glacier out and that was, that was what was down at the bottom where the glacier was. And so it just kept changing. Uh, it was very dynamic and a very, this is, these are geysers and fumaroles and mud pots and it was like, like Yellowstone Park almost. And, and uh, my plane was such a tool, a wonderful tool. I could travel everywhere and, and, and uh, watch the animals. And <clears throat> when I first saw this, these trails, I, I couldn't believe that they weren't made by something like a herds of hundreds of thousands or, of caribou or, or bison or something, but they were, it was all bear. Uh, activity. There was no other animal there to make trails but the bears. So, and they were worn a foot into the foot into the ground some places. So it was it was the most. I I thought I died and gone to heaven actually. <laughs> and and here here uh, you know the one reason is that they're very protective. They could add so much to eat. Uh, there's we have. Bears with five, uh, four cubs, and even five. I've seen pictures of black bears with five. These are grizzly bears. Uh, uh, this day, I saw two sets of four cubs, <clears throat> and I saw this female. I watched her for s several years. She raised all four. You can see she's she's big and burly, and she was a good mother. <clears throat> But below the cabin that I built, it was this place, uh, a, a, fall, a small falls, and, and these bear males, they were all males, six of them right in this picture, were eating, they were actually eating char, sea run char, that, and not salmon, but there was lots of salmon, as this picture showed. So the place was bountiful. Of the, this, this, Particular grizzly was standing up to her knees in, in sand and bumping into her. She just standing. I watched her just stand there, and uh, I realized eventually that she was just sick of eating sand. <laughs> <laughs> this bear had shed all his winter hair, which is long longer than the new hair coming in except on his ears. <laughs> he, was still, he was still to shed his ears. My plane, as I said, was a wonderful tool. I even load that green bag up and hang it off <laughs> this outside because there wasn't room enough inside. So I really worked that. And it, it was very powerful and very, very good. And that's the cabin that built in 1996. And I was there the last time in, in 2007. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to call my book Under the Volcano, but Malcolm Lowry, a wonderful writer from Mexico, used that title, of course. I, I, I restrained. <laughs> Looking, that's the cabin here, looking the other direction. The next picture is taken, my plane, about on the other side of that pass. So you can just give you a feeling of the, of the countryside. Look, the cabin is here. The other picture looking out over this fair. And then back at the cabin was the next picture. Is, is that that same past being spilled over the fog from the east coast to the Pacific. The cabin was about 10 miles from the Pacific, North Pacific, and 
10 miles from the Sea of Akash, down at the tip of that peninsula. So, uh, it, it's a spectacular place. It, this this fog flowing like water in uh, another direction from the roof of the cabin. You're showing what I call Charred Creek drainage. And, uh, it, unbelievable place to, to see um, bears and to live with them. It was a, there were 400 bears in that area. And I re also rescued cubs. It's a long story of how uh, my book tells it better, but I actually would buy these cubs from the zoo. And, and the first set, this set, that I had to, I couldn't get permission. I actually stole or took them without permission. I bought them from the zoo, but I took them into my cabin without permission. So it, it, I got into lots of trouble with, over that, as you can imagine. But it, somehow I pulled it off and, and were allowed to continue. It was amazing to go from that to, to freedom that I would give them. And I could take them out, walk, right? This was like not very long after they arrived. They, they had this kind of freedom. And, they they knew that they needed some protection and whoops and I I would do that. They were very mindful to stay stay around me. Once they were very exuberant, and sometimes they get a bit far away, but they would come back. It was uh, I didn't know what I was doing really. But, um, one year I had five at one time. Uh, <clears throat> one of them was called Buck, and this was when discovering Buck. He was at a hot spring near the city, and the pe people were just they were charged to take pictures of him. And he lived in this little wood place. And of course, when they get a little too old, just like in the zoo, uh, they don't have a good facility and they start hurting people, they're just killed. That's why I took them, or you know, wanted them. And this is Buck, the same little bear that we saw in the previous picture a couple of years later. <clears throat> Chico, Chico is an amazing bear. She, she had so much energy, she just dug this hole in the snow and then was trying to pull it in on top of herself. <laughs> they, they were full of energy and full high speed, uh, roaring around, and then they would just crash. <laughs> for an hour, they just they were sacked out. <clears throat> I had to feed cubs, and uh, here's and Sheena in a bowl, wait, waiting to be fed, because it was a regimented time. They, they got on to it. I fed them very, quite, well, just uh, two times a day, but right at, usually near the same time anyway. And she had about 20 minutes to go, and then she's looking kind of grumpy, waiting. <laughs> Here she is, doing it. <laughs> she's a little bigger, same bowl, same bear. I, the cabin, the fence I built around the cabin it was just to keep the bears away from the cabin, to keep them away out of the garbage. And we looked after the garbage really well. Uh, the, there were very few rules, but I just didn't want them harming my stuff. Uh, that's my plane down there, and there you see one wire going down to the plane. Uh, they, and I wasn't going to harm them in any way, so that was our that was our rules. And I, I kept the fences tight so that we didn't just just you know have to fence off big areas. Left the beach for them, and you can see the wires just behind there. We didn't even have any posts there, and only two wires because that's where I brought the plane in and out. Three wires around the rest. Uh, a steady stream of bears passed it. 
It was there for eight years and no, no bear heard it. <clears throat> and that young bear is about to get a lesson about electric fence. <laughs> <laughs> I used low valve, quite low voltage, uh, 3,000 volts really. <laughs> that doesn't sound very low. But, but actually, uh, some of these big cattle energizers fence for 25 miles of fence, uh, like 8,000 plus, they've got quite a, a bit of amp, you know, too much amperage, I think. So I, I, I did experiments with these low voltage uh, energizers, and I put a fence around this research station. It's that line right here, around, and I, 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 again, I, I kept it tight, and they loved, they, they had garden, you see a garden here, there was salt shed here, uh, so and these are things that the bears, plus they just were, you know, there was 25 people lived here with their family, kids, they couldn't go out anywhere without bumping into a bear, and they were nervous about it, it was a sanctuary for bears and, and for salmon. This was a, a weir that they would, had a gate in here uh, that they would count. And it was there for 60 years. They would count the salmon through. Their average of about a million point two of salmon a year came through. You can see this black, they, these are salmon, that darkness in the water. And uh, so there was a lot of bears, but it, it completely, and they, they would break, break the weir. Uh, and I, I rigged a wire, part of it right across, so that at both ends where they would break it, they couldn't get at the fence, uh, because they would chase the salmon up against the weir, and the weir was polyethylene pipe, made out of polyethylene pipe, so they would break through it. So that stopped that too, this was a constant problem. So a very simple, I only worked on that for three or four days, and it's still there 15 years later. <clears throat> Looking at toilets, uh, my, the toilet, uh, I, I, I experimented with this wire around what, only 10 inches off the ground, and that was there for five years, Bear never bothered it. Of course, I had a little more wire on the top, front, but, all it really did was trip me up, I think. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is why we have to have a, a, you you know wire around the thing that bears love to get into outhouses. <laughs> and the the fence around there the. the cabin and also around, the, I had a 50 meter by 50 meter that, that the cubs could be in uh, when they came, came back. So they weren't in this, that little cabin that I also built for them. They, and every day we took them for walks. And it was a great life for them. As you can see, they were here, they were spotted a bear in the mist. And they were naturally afraid of other bears. Just some images of, of the great life rather than the zoo uh, because they would have been dead already at that age. And it's rosy amongst the rhododendrons. <laughs> these, these are Kamchatka rhododendron. These are uh, geranium, wild geranium. Like our sticky geranium, or at least in Alberta we have sticky geranium. <laughs> discovered that, that they always hiked, or they always went for walks in this order with, with Chico, Biscuit, and then Rosie up at the back. And we, we take up behind, but uh, noticed that Rosie wasn't too comfortable with that. And it was because Rosie's job was to watch the back trail, and then if you're in the way, it, it kind of disturbed her. So by just changing the place, the order, so that we walk ahead of Rosie. 
that, that really helped the whole situation. So little things like that uh, made, made a big change for their comfort. I, I wanted them to learn how to fish and I caught these char and left them alive and then put them in a place that they couldn't get away from the cubs in a little creek and then taught them how to or you know just put them there and encourage them to catch them. I wanted to, to do that because mothers kind of spoil them. They, they catch all the fish and cubs don't learn right away but I knew that they had to be independent from me very quickly. In fact they had to dam the first year before they were a year old so they needed needed this to be in the, you know self-sufficient and they they soon learned to do that and, and when they got good at meat fishing whoops this thing doesn't go when I want it to yeah back back please um, when I got I'm good at meat fishing and taught them to sport fish. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, but really, that's just a joke, really. Uh, <laughs> and as you probably guessed, actually. Yeah, but anyway, this is what they were supposed to be doing in the lake, yet yeah, in the shallow water, where they were, where the salmon were spawning, and it was it was quite worthwhile feed when they did catch so the salmon. Died is shortly after they spawn, and and they would catch them before uh, you know they were dead often, but then pick up dead ones along the shore too. <clears throat> Great life with bears, and, but and they had lots to eat besides salmon. Like these are three species of berries right together. That's the crowberry, <coughs> blueberry, and oh, and bear bearberry here. So they don't eat the bear very much. <coughs> Another spe species, the, the, this is a, an ermine, but they were very similar to our short-tailed weasel, which is an ermine, of course. Here's the foxes. There were lots of foxes around. There wasn't a lot of animals because the snow was so deep, but anything living off roads, because there were a lot of roads around, and birds, like ptarmigan and that's what the, the foxes liked and they were so friendly I just I could play with this fox it was beautiful mm -hmm. and uh, the same ermine only a month or two month and a half month and a half later when the snow coming and the lake freezing and the cubs I was worried about them falling in the lake, but they didn't. They, they were smart enough, uh, without me teaching, <laughs> that, that if it cracked under them when they went out on it, that that was not good. They would scurry back on the shore. And as soon as it was thick enough that it didn't crack, then that was their signal to just go and have a beautiful time. <clears throat> and the, the shore, because of the springs along there where the salmon, <coughs> the salmon spawn it was the last to freeze up. Sheena was an amazing bear because they all had different habits and, and different affections. And, but Sheena was one of the most affectionate. She she had to have a, a hug in the morning and a, and a little play. And, that's how she needed to start her day. <laughs> and when and when a storm like this would come in in November, and they would disappear. I wouldn't see them for seven months. Uh, and this, uh, flying back in in the spring, 
this is the view of the snow. It was amazing depths of snow because there's two oceans, as I said, and no matter which way, the moist air would come over the land and dump the snow on the land. <clears throat> and you can see these, these are bear trails here and here. Another one across here. So they, there were lots of bears out when they come back in the spring, but hadn't seen the cubs. Dump off the, the helicopter, brought in everything as you see, dumped it on the snow. And the, the cabin was sitting up on a hill. There's the, the snow was deep enough it covered every bush. It's melted down here, but in the winter, no bush it'll, can stick up above the snow because it just gets cut off by flying snow. With 100 mile an hour winds, it would like act like like a sandblaster, and it just so that's why when you look at the, the foliage there, it's it's the only high, high high trees are in the coolies, and and they're not really trees. It's just bushes and pines. Uh, this was a, a, a known predator male, and uh, I would worry it might have got the cut. This was on the first year that we raised them. I raised ten all together, and uh, this is uh, with Chico Biscuit and Rosie, which were the first. Thing. But I thought these were the tracks of what it looked like. There were three of them, and sure enough. Uh, there, there were three bears, and I called to them, and and they come running down the slope right away. Seven months after I'd seen them last, right walking in my tracks. I don't know why, because I was wearing rubber boots, but they seemed to be able to smell something in my tracks. And, and then Chico, that was her, her uh, greeting was to mesh her claws with my fingers. Mm. And, Oh yeah, like uh, I mentioned, I had five one year, and roaming, roaming with the five bears was absolutely beautiful. But but there's another predator bear. It, well, there weren't that many, but they were the bane of my life because uh, they were a threat. And sometimes uh, when they when the predator would come close, I would tell them about it. I would chuffed to them in a certain way and they knew that that was the bear and, and he, they would crowd around me so close that I couldn't walk. <laughs> but right there, they had doing that and the bear was far enough away that they, they hadn't crowded in yet. But just, just a, a photo of, well actually here, Chico, she would come and lie down beside me when she wanted to sleep because she wanted me to rub the, the mosquitoes off her nose and her eyes because that was the only vulnerable place she had, really, other than her feet, but she would tuck her feet under her. <laughs> That's Guy and Buck. <clears throat> and so this is, th this is the relationship I could have. With, uh, the relationship was what I was understanding. I have two scientist brothers. And no, in biology, they don't teach about having a relationship, uh, developing relationship, because that's sort of a, a contaminant to a studying bears. They want they want to study bears though you don't exist. And and I wanted to understand if it was possible to live with these animals in a nice way. And so we, so I, I couldn't get the answers from my brothers. About, uh, about anything that I, when I was ranching, about what I needed to know as far as living with the animals concerned, or what was possible with these animals. So I had to go out and explore this on my own. And th this is what I found. Uh, I guess that's why I'm up here, uh, and not them, because, uh, <laughs> because I found this amazing, Amazing different story than most most scientists tell us, because uh, <clears throat> oh, anyway, there we go. Just just images of of beauty of, of 
being able to get along. And it wasn't just with the cubs, it was an animal like this was, we called it the bear, fisherman bear, because he was such a good fisherman, but he was also an amazing, beautiful animal just to be around. And he, he would, he, he chose to be around a lot. As I said, there were 400 animals in a fairly small area around. Uh, in the whole sanctuary, there was 2,000 bears. <clears throat> and there's fisherman bear, just lounging on. You can, you can tell by looking at his face, he's not going to hurt anybody. At least I can tell. And also, amazing thing with the, the certain females would leave their cubs with me to babysit. <laughs> when they first did that, they didn't. didn't there's another one here, there are two of them. Uh, they, the cubs didn't like it when they were little. They, when the female first did that in the spring, they were. They, they didn't, and she would just take off and leave them to get some freedom. They would never do that with any other bear or any, you know, no people around that they would do that with. So, but, so it was a, it was a thing about trust because that's what I wanted to explore. How much could you trust these animals? And when they figured out that they could trust us, this is what they would do. And, and the gri grizzly bear, grizzly bear is considered the female with cubs, is considered the most dangerous animal that you can, bump into in the woods and and so so this is what happens though and they are because they're protective and they don't you know if their only experience with people is years and years maybe 25 years of of abuse then they are going to be dangerous but if they can trust you they take advantage of you like this my god <laughs> It's a pretty wonderful way to be taken advantage of. <clears throat> I just amused, I had to be amusing around them sometimes. And laying down, kicking them around my feet, they, they thought that was amusing. But here, here is an example where you don't need to be worried about being between a female and her cubs if, if they aren't worried about you. Bear get brandy. She's feeding her cubs, <clears throat> and I, yeah. I, I, another time, she had any cubs were a year older. She's still feeding them. I was almost standing on her back feet, <clears throat> and she wasn't. She was in, a good bear to teach me because. She was cranky there. <laughs> he didn't want to make a mistake around her. And I made a few. Mainly, the main mistake was that if I got between, got in her way when she was uh, fishing. If she was, I would get in her way and, you know, between the fish and, the, and her, and she would really get pissed off if Robert had to say. <laughs> I guess I could use that word if he did. <laughs> anyway, here's Brandy leaving me with her cup today. It was. I call this the opera singers. <laughs> but, uh, they weren't making any noise when I, when I took the picture. And Buck. Still, he, he was round, and his thing was high fives. That was his greeting. So he he was up on the lake, up above the lake shore. We're walking along. This is Irina, uh, assistant, a Russian assistant. She was amazing with the bear. And uh, you notice we always have bear spray, but <laughs> not not too worried about. But it was there. And anyway, here's walk up the hill, Buck gets up on his haunches and does his high five. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Jeff, Jeff came to do the Edge of Eden, uh, make the film Edge of Eden in 2005. And this is Sky and Jeff I like, caught at a nice moment when she was just tracing one claw around the crystal of his watch. I watched her, she made about three circles on the watch crystal with, his, with one claw. And it was the most beautiful thing. And Jeff just watched her there do it very nice, beautifully. Jeff was amazing with bears too. <clears throat> Pictures of the beautiful weather. <laughs> It wasn't always that beautiful, but the bears loved it. They were in good mood when the weather was like this, too. But there were times when the lake wasn't as calm as this, like the next picture. My plane uprooted, 100 mile an hour wind. It was badly broken, but I mainly managed to have enough materials. In three weeks, I had it flying again. It's an advantage when you build a plane yourself. You know how to fix it when you can. <laughs> Idyllic life of my bears. There was a year difference between those last two uh, in the ages of the cubs. So we had two sets of cubs that year. One was two, two year olds, and the other were cubs in the year. See, it goes back to that, that uh, Nicholas Rorick's paintings. This is how this is where the scene he would have loved to have painted. Oh, here's a dangerous situation. <laughs> Bear standing up with blood on her face. But now she comes down, sits down by the lake, want, wants to have a chat. <laughs> she thought of George Bush's idea of building trust. <laughs> it was quite a deep, con deep conversation. <laughs> it took a while, but she eventually wasn't that impressed. <laughs> I'm making a jump here to my my ranch that I own. It's a family ranch. It's been in the family 107 years. Uh, but there's one quarter where everyone lives. Uh, it's an enclave. Uh, and there's about four or five houses. Uh, and, and we all decided, okay, we, we're going to live with these animals. And I guess maybe I had a little more influence in, uh, on it. But but it was my family really cooperated. This is my ex-wife's place. She and her husband lived in a, uh, here, and oops, and uh, these are bear t these taken from the porch. But they also had a cougar show up on the deck, and and the next morning it was still there. <laughs> And no, no problem. There, there were no dogs to chase it away, and they were happy to have it there. It, it went out. It was minus 25. Went out on the trail to the to the garage, and take over the garage for a little while, and, and come back to the lake and sleep on the welcome mat. Why not, eh? So. 
my brother John built this bear bath. It's a bird combination of bird bath and bear bath. <laughs> Here the birds are are enjoying the bear the lower parts of the bear bath and the top is a bird. And a and a black bear comes along and and this day was cool so he didn't go for a bath. But the grizzlies did. It's just out the picture window. This is uh, what the most, you know, the the people in charge. Uh, it's, they tell you. If a bear shows up like this around Phonus, then we'll get rid of it, or you know, drug it, or and they would they normally they give them a hard release, which is uh, uh, catch them in a in a bear culvert and then take them out. They when they turn them loose, they hit them with rubber bullets, noise makers, they turn dogs loose on them. This is what a hard release did, uh, but we find that this is. This is what happens if you don't do that. They, they're perfectly safe. I, I bumped into one grizzly at night uh, there in pitch black dark, big wolf scared, you know, a wolf, you know, shuffling, and because uh, I spooked it, and, but it didn't hurt me. Uh, you see, this is, you know, but I'm not as comfortable with the bears. It, it, around Waterton Park is where I live because because of this other thing that's happening to them all the time. They, they're they getting beat up every time they, they try to be friends with us. So I never know the history of the bear. So so how, you know, so what I'm trying to do is is, is get people to to under, you know, to, to, to the management to soften up so that they can be be more so that the bears can be more reliable because I think that we create dangerous bears by what we do to them. Like who wants to be shot, for instance? And a lot of them don't die because they, they carry a bullet. There's a study about that up in Alaska about how 60 percent of bears in a bear viewing area were carrying bullets. And, they did that because the bear viewing area was next to a hunting area, and so they asked the hunters to, that they could do a top on them. So, so here you're mixing hunting and bear viewing, 60% were carrying bullets, and yet they didn't hurt anybody in the bear viewing area. That's supposed to say the end. <laughs>